Okay, thank you guys. Good morning, everybody. So continuing in the theme of how I do it, I'm gonna talk about my approach to the evaluation of mesenteric ischemia. So for the next few minutes, I'm gonna describe the techniques we use for the examination of the mesenteric vessels, discuss methods to optimize the examination, review current protocols and criteria, and I'm gonna finish off with my seven keys to success. So, for the evaluation of mesenteric ischemia, we typically consider if the patient is presenting with acute symptoms or chronic pain. Obviously, we know when patients present acutely because they come into the emergency room with severe abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and usually those patients are whisked off for a CT angiogram if there's a concern for vascular compromise. The patients that we typically see in ultrasound have chronic abdominal pain, fairly nonspecific. They have pain after eating sometimes. Uh, they may give you a history of fear of food in that when they eat, they, they have abdominal pain, may complain of weight loss and not enjoying food so that they take in small meals. So the causes of this type of pain, mesenteric ischemia, can be related to arterial stenosis or occlusion can be due to venous thrombosis, or less commonly may be related to a non-occlusive process, such as patients have low flow, <clears throat> excuse me, related to shock or hypotension. So classically, patients with chronic mesenteric ischemia, as I mentioned, may have what they call mesenteric angina, pain after eating. The pain is typically nonspecific, and these patients usually have other atherosclerotic syndromes give you a history of uh, lower extremity arterial occlusive disease, history of MI or CVA. If you look at the ACR appropriateness criteria, you'll see that ultrasound is listed right below CT angiography for the evaluation of chronic mesenteric ischemia, right there with conventional arteriography. And of course, the advantage is there's no radiation associated with our ultrasound exam. Now, for the ultrasound examination, the findings typically are nonspecific with grayscale. We'll see some bowel wall thickening and distension, and typically there may be some ascites. So, of course, we're going to perform the Doppler evaluation to look for patency of the abdominal vessels. So, for the evaluation of the mesenteric arteries, we're going to be looking for evidence of vascular compromise in the celiac, superior mesenteric and inferior mesenteric near the origin from the abdominal aorta and into the proximal segments. For the diagnosis of chronic mesenteric ischemia, we typically need to see stenosis or occlusion of at least two of those three vessels. And as I mentioned, it's not really recommended for an acute presentation. Those patients with acute thrombosis typically should go for CT angiography. So as part of our protocol, We'll start out with an evaluation of the abdominal aorta, looking for aneurysm, plaque stenosis, and then we're going to take samples from the celiac, superior mesenteric, and inferior mesenteric arteries. Of course, for all of our examinations, we want to optimize both the grayscale and the color Doppler, taking a look first at the abdominal aorta, nice sagittal view, looking for evidence of plaque, and we're going to turn the color on to look for vessel patency and evidence of stenosis or thrombosis. So we want to adjust the color gain, pulse repetition frequency, and wall filter so that we normalize to laminar flow. So in a normal vessel, we see a nice homogeneous color flow pattern, no evidence of disturbed flow or aliasing to suggest an abnormality. This allows us to screen the vessel very quickly. Now, normal flow patterns in the mesenteric circulation typically run into flavors, right? We can get the low resistance pattern typically in the proximal aorta that feeds the celiac and the renal arteries, and we can have a high resistance pattern in the distal aorta that feeds the lower extremities as it becomes a high resistance triphasic pattern. And it's also interesting to note that the flow in the mesenteric arteries is typically very high resistance in the fasting state. 
And we use that as a check for, to know if patients are fasting because if they don't have a high resistance pattern in the mesenteric arteries, that we know they're cheating and they probably had breakfast. So here's some examples of normal flow patterns. And you can see in the abdominal aorta, proximally, near the origin of the celiac, has continuous forward flow throughout diastole, as we would expect in the celiac artery, because the celiac, again, is feeding the low resistance organs of the liver and the spleen. The superior mesenteric artery, on the other hand, typically has little to no flow in diastole in the fasting state. Here in normal fasting measurements, typically around 100 centimeters per second, keep in mind that the flow velocities in the celiac and mesenteric arteries should closely resemble the velocities in the abdominal aorta. It should be a close to a one-to-one -one ratio. So we think about velocities around 100 centimeters per second for the celiac and the SMA, maybe a little bit higher in the IMA. Now, this chart just shows that there are lots of different articles that were published to describe diagnostic criteria by multiple authors looking at different criteria with different sensitivities, specificities, and cutoffs. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to boil this down to what a number of proposed diagnostic criteria there are. And we look at three specific areas to evaluate. The peak systolic velocity, the aortic mesenteric ratio, and the end diastolic velocity. And here are all the published criteria. So what I did some years ago is we looked at these different criteria in a subset of 205 patients that were referred for the evaluation of the mesenteric arteries. And in this group, we had angiographic correlation on all of them, and I pulled the data from the mesenteric studies and I found that of these three different criteria, the most sensitive and the most accurate is the peak systolic velocity. The mesenteric aortic ratio is neither as sensitive or as specific as the peak systolic velocity, but is useful to have as a check, very much like we do with the carotid studies. We use that ICACC ratio as a check on the peak systolic velocity. And the end diastolic velocity, I found, wasn't very sensitive, but it adds some specificity. And again, like the end diastolic velocity in the ICI, I sort of reserved that to the back. So these are the criteria we use. This is what I recommend, to look first at the peak systolic velocity. And those velocities are 200 centimeters per second for a cutoff for stenosis in the celiac and IMA, and the monetic criterion of 275 centimeters per second for a cutoff in the SMA. And then to augment that, by looking at the mesenteric aortic ratio, typically if it's greater than th three to one, it's, it's certainly abnormal, and looking for post-stenotic turbulence. So here in this example, the celiac artery has an elevated velocity over 300 centimeters per second. And as you continue to drag your sample volume, you can see classic post-stenotic turbulence with decreased velocity, bi-directional flow, and is very shaggy picket fence type post stenotic waveform. So when you look at your image with color dop, look for evidence of color aliasing, see the change in the color in the area of the stenosis, and color brewery, that flash that occurs over the stenosis in real time. And when we do the pulse Doppler sampling, obviously you'll ele elevated peak systolic velocities in the stenosis, and as you move downstream, you'll see the post stenotic turbulence and frequently tardis parvus waveforms. Now here's an example, 68-year-old with abdominal pain, and we're sampling the peak systolic velocity. Velocity is 131, it's within the normal range, under 200. But as we look at the superior mesenteric artery, we see this aliasing and a little bit of color brewy artifact at the origin of the SMA. And when we place the sample volume angle correct to the direction of flow in the SMA, the velocity is 400 centimeters per second, so clearly a high-grade stenosis. Next, we're going to check the inferior mesenteric artery, and that is also irregular with aliasing. And when we take the peak systolic velocity from the IMAC, it's also elevated at 368. And we compare it to the velocity in the aorta, which is 72. So we have two vessel disease consistent with chronic mesenteric ischemia. Now, people always ask, what about postprandial studies? That's very old school. You know, 
Years ago, we would challenge a patient with a meal, and we'd look at the mesenteric vessels before and after eating. And we stopped doing that years ago because it's really not necessary. Uh, this study shows that you can identify high-grade stenosis whether you do fasting or postprandial studies. Now, one thing I don't want you to forget is looking at the mesenteric veins. As a cause of mesenteric ischemia, venous thrombosis occurs in about 10% of cases uh, with up to 50% mortality. And it's typically seen in a younger population. Again, the, the presentation may be nonspecific. It's variable. And the typical course is thrombosis of the superior mesenteric vein with involvement of the ileum and jejunum. And here's an example of thrombosis of the splenic vein into the portal confluence. Here's another example of a patient that presented with abdominal pain, an elevated liver function test, and we can see that there's thrombus in the splenic vein extending into the portal vein and also in the superior mesenteric vein confirmed on the CT angiogram. Now, there's a number of pitfalls to keep in mind. Uh, you can have anatomic variants, the median arc ligament sy syndrome, which I'll talk about in a second. There's vessel tortuosity, which makes it difficult to, to angle correct. Aneurysmal dilatation of the abdominal aorta, which will cause decreased velocities. Aortic stenosis, which may cause increased velocities and tardis waveforms. Cardiac arrhythmia, which can cause marked variability in the peak systolic velocity measurements and of course postprandial states which will cause increased velocities even if you think the patient may be fasting. So here I'm gonna finish up with my seven keys to success. Number one, patients should be fasting prior to the study. Check on that, tell them in advance. Scan all three arteries and check the veins. Take velocity samples from the sagittal views. Don't forget to sample the aorta. Check angle correction carefully. Sample through presumed stenosis to assess the post-stenotic turbulence and evaluate for median arcuate ligament syndrome. So again, patients should be fasting. I like to do it the night before and I schedule my patients in the morning. It reduces the scatter and attenuation from bowel gas, as you see on this image, which can make it a non-diagnostic study. We don't give any medication prior to the exam. Number two, scan all three arteries. Again, in order to make the diagnosis of chronic mesenteric ischemia, you have to find disease in at least two of the three vessels. So look for the IMA. Studies have shown you can see the IMA in most of your patients, particularly when they're fasting. We use a velocity cutoff of 200 centimeters per second. Take velocity samples from the sagittal views. This is probably the most common mistake I see in, in, in studies that are done. You can see a longer course of the vessel, you can improve your angle correction, and you can get accurate velocity measurements. Don't forget the aorta. Again, the velocity should be similar in the mesenteric vessels to the abdominal aorta. So think about the mesenteric aortic ratio as your check. And this avoids multiple pitfalls from aortic stenosis, which again could increase velocities and cause tardis waveforms, aortic aneurysms, which can decrease the normal velocities and can cause aberrations in your evaluation. Number three, check your angle correction carefully. Many errors are related to poor angle correction. The Doppler angle should be in the direction of blood flow. You need to see the vessel well and drag the sample volume through the origin into the vessel lumen. Avoid multiple measurements at different angles. I think this is another very common mistake. People take five, six, seven measurements from the same vessel and then you have this array of velocities you don't know what to do with. It. Take few measurements and carefully angle correct. And here in this example, you can see when the SMA is not well seen, the velocity is 136, but when you extend the vessel, see the longer course, the velocity is really 219. Sample through the stenosis, very important for all of our arterial studies. Always sample through the stenosis to look for the post-stenotic turbulence. Here you can see in this example, the celiac velocity is obviously elevated. But as you move through it, you get that post-stenotic signal. Velocity drops, bidirectional flow, very shaggy waveform. It confirms it's a flow-reducing lesion. And finally, check for the median arcuate ligament. Now, the median arcuate ligament, as most of you know, is this leaflet of the diaphragm that crosses the celiac artery. You can see nicely here in this illustration, and here on this sagittal MRI, you can see the indentation on the celiac artery that occurs with rest or expiration. And that causes increased velocities during that phase of respiration. 
And the pain that the patients experience can be related to the vascular or nerve compression. I'm really not sure. But we do know in some patients they do get relief when you cut the ligament. So we may see elevated velocities at rest, but they go away when you have the patient taking a deep breath. And here in this example, you can see this patient is in expiration. You get this sort of fish hook appearance as the ligament is tugging on the celiac artery, causing narrowing, aliasing, and increased velocities up to 450 centimeters per second. But then when you have the patient taking a big inspiration, you can see velocities come right back down into the normal range. So this is a very common pitfall, particularly in thin patients, and we see it especially in young women. So here I'm going to conclude. There are multiple non-invasive techniques that we can use for the evaluation of mesenteric vascular disease. We've had a very high success rate using Doppler ultrasound. And again, there's no radiation. We evaluate for peak systolic velocity and post as our primary parameters. And don't forget the veins. Thank you very much.